Thank you, Simon and Aka, for having me. Um, the topic of my talk today is on biodiversity considerations in culture-based fisheries. So um, I had the privilege to be involved in culture-based fisheries related work since my master time in 2004, worked with An and colleagues in Vietnam, um, it's more on development of their first publications on the work and the project in Vietnam. And uh, since I became the genetic coordinator of the biodiversity program for NACA, I embarked on uh, deploying the technologies to the regions. Um, and in that work, I found biodiversity consideration in CBF actually are uh, very important. Um, aquaculture is very fast growing food production sectors. Um, it provides a need for food for our growing populations, but we have uh, quite a reputation in terms of negative impact on the environment. It's more on the salmon and shrimp aquaculture, but you can see also in uh, some extent uh, in even small scale aquaculture, you can also see the impact. Culture Bay Fisheries is a low input, uh, environmental friendly in terms of low inputs. However, if we don't manage um, properly, it may have impacts on the wild fisheries as well. So our role is not just to improve production, but try to balance the benefit and also the negative impact and try to save the planet for the next generations. Um, this map shows some of the ACIR projects. Um, some happened before my time, but some also uh, when I started at NACA in 2004. Um, ACIR project on culture based fishery development probably started in Sri Lanka, uh, Upali, in you know, about 1994 and then Vietnam in 1997 and we can see that the um, the technology actually worked in terms of rural livelihood and providing protein for these communities. Um, NACA developed a proposal to ACAR and tried to deploy these technologies to other countries in the regions and the uptake was actually really great in Laos and Cambodia. Uh, we follow up with three other projects. In terms of species selections for culture bay fisheries, uh, as usual, uh, project normally go and consult with local communities and look for seed availability and whether um, exotic indigenous um, in terms of, you know, what available, what the people like to grow uh, in the community ponds, for example, or in reservoir. Um, so we, we have a mixture of um, species in demand, a busy for, busy that fit for the needs. So it could be indigenous or exotic, and you can see throughout today. Um, sorry, I missed some of the presentations, but uh, it's a combination of in, indigenous and exotic species. Um, for culture bay fisheries, because some are practiced in non perennial water bodies, we need to have species that actually grow really fast so that uh, it can reach the market size um, at harvest when the water is low, for example. It should have good survival um, and, and should not breed uh, because when species actually breed in, in um, culture bay fisheries, one is energy divert to uh, reproduction, but not so much in growth. And also if they interbreed with local, say indigenous um, stock that may have negative consequences, which I will illustra illustrate a little bit later, of course. It has to be edible, edible have to be marketable, and also uh, the ability to mass produce uh, or hatchery production should be available. So for example, in Laos in 2014, we have uh, a lot of hatcheries for a number of species, but in Laopedia for indigenous uh, species, silver barb, 
uh, mud carp and plapia or labio chrysophycardion and catfish are, are most popular in terms of um, uh, preferred species for culture bay fisheries. So, um, in the region, uh, species that are exotic um, are mainly tilapia, major Indian and Chinese carp. The good things about the species is at the moment we haven't seen any negative impact on the local environment. Uh, artificial propagation for these are really well established. Um, and as I said earlier, most of the species do not show any impact on local diversity, except for the story about the Afri African walking catfish. Um, they are fast growing, so that they are really suitable for culture bay fisheries in non-perennial water bodies. So the, the, the focus for these species are mainly on improving production. So how to, to get the stock grow faster. Um, so to get a fast growing um, stock, um, we need to have breeding program, but should we have a breeding program dedicated to CBF at all? It's quite unlikely because the demand is, um, sorry, it's quite unlikely because it's quite expensive and it requires ex specialized expertise. Um, and I, I don't think there are many actually well-structured established breeding program even for normal aquaculture in the region, let alone CBF. So uh, we can pick packing on the seed that you for aquaculture operations and um, this is, is the case in, in all countries at the moment, I could say. Uh, however, um, we need to be aware that some of the hatchery stockfish um, may not be really perform well in, in, in CBF because um, they're different environment altogether and there's huge um, genetic by environmental interactions happening. For example, some of the gift tilapia in Sri Lankan reservoir doesn't perform as well as um, the Y stock. Uh, so the use of indigenous species, um, to me, this is the most tricky part. Uh, many communities like to, to eat the fish that they're familiar with. Um, some of the species they use for culture bay fisheries actually are really well adapted to the local environment. Um, propagation of this species, some of the species actually well developed, but some are not. And more and more people go and try to propagate or domesticate more species that they like to. Um, the, the, the most tricky part I'm mentioning here is the negative genetic impact on the wild counterparts. Um, with exotic species interbreeding between species actually more difficult than the, the same species that come from different stocks, say hatchery stock that was intermingled with the local stock. So we don't actually um, know what the consequence is like unless we have really good plan and monitoring programs. Um, so one way to minimize that impact is to use supportive breeding. What it means was uh, we can go and collect rootstock from the local water and breed those fish and release um, and use the, the bread fish for culture bay fisheries. So the local culture bay fishery with the local wild stock are similar enough so that they don't actually have any negative impact on each other. The second um, option is to have an investigation and better understanding on population genetic structure of the species of interest. But this requires, again, uh, molecular genetics um, sort of expertise, 
resources, laboratories. It is quite an expensive game as well. Um, I don't know how many of the um, breeding hatcheries in the region actually have that sort of uh, resources and investigation going on or consideration at all in terms of uh, the potential negative impact of hatchery fish on the wild stock. Um, the best we could do is apply some basis on to avoid uh, inbreeding and, and genetic deterioration in the hatcheries. So uh, some of the, uh, we can talk about this you know, days to day, but the basic, for example, is um, we try to spawn uh, as many broodstock as possible in each season, um, spawn an equal number of male, and, and sorry, that's male fish, not make fish. Uh, there's a typo there. Um, this, this is easy said than done. Uh, often people use more male than female because the low maintenance in terms of number of, of male bush fish um, undertake single pair mate teams um, so that they can maximize the diversity or minimize the inbreeding. Uh, also try to avoid selection. Don't just try to breed bigger fish and not breed smaller fish. So the more selection um, uh, intensity, the, the, the more reduced uh, diversity you have in the next generation. And also one principle is to replace bush stock more regularly so that you have um, closer relationship of the wife and the capture or the stock that you use for culture bay fisheries so that uh, the, the, in, the difference are, are lost less. So uh, are you an example to, to, to elaborate my point about the negative impact uh, of different stocks um, in terms of what it might do in terms of biodiversity? Uh, this is part of my master's when I did at Deakin in 1999. So in, in, in Margaret River in Western Australia, we have on the left is a, a marron species, a freshwater crayfish that's quite hairy on the thorax. Um, and over number of years, it's only one decade, uh, two decades. And you can see that one, this form actually disappear because they were in introduction of a smoother form of marron. You see the image from the right. So over, um, two decades, uh, a species actually completely wiped off uh, because of this inadvertent introduction of a different form of the same species into um, the same water body. Uh, the WA government has to spend a lot of money to recover the former forms in, in this part of the Margaret River. Uh, lots of resources have to put forward and well planned to, to restore and also maintain this important diversity. Uh, it's quite an iconic uh, species in uh, WA and therefore it's important to have that diversity um, in the, uh, as, as its origin. So in summary, uh, as many, many of you have already presented today, CBF is an environmental friendly practice in terms of low input, like because we don't, it doesn't require lots of feeding uh, or, and therefore it doesn't pollute the water. However, the, the genetic diversity part of it need to be considered and try to be taken into account in any CBF development in the future. Um, it requires careful planning by incorporating conservation, uh, conservation aspects or biodiversity aspect in the operations. Um, and any development, it, it, won't, it won't be able to have no environmental impact. It can be that, cannot be that ideal, but at least to try to minimize that in balance with the desired outcome of having better livelihood for rural communities. So this is some of the image that uh, 
I was in participating in the field trip in Laos, so that part of CBF, you got to learn to how to drink the local brew and et cetera. Um, I tried to dedicate this work to um, Sena, who is the, um, the person who spearheaded uh, CBF from Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and now throughout the region. And he also the former DG of Laika, and I'm grateful to be uh, his student, his partner, and learning through this process uh, how to improve uh, livelihoods uh, for the rural people. And um, I can't be happier than seeing the little girl here uh, catching fish as part of a harvest for, from a CBF operation in Laopedia. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.